Welcome to Hayes Memorial UMC Online. The purpose of Hayes Memorial UMC is valuing all people, discovering faith, and engaging community. If you'd like to know more about our church, please visit www.hayesmemorialumc.org. From danger, 
can seal it, seal it for thy courts above. Follow me. Matthew chapter 9, verses 9 through 13, 18 through 26. As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man called Matthew sitting at the tax booth. And he said to him, Follow me. And he got up and followed him. And as he sat at dinner in the house, many tax collectors and sinners came and were sitting with him and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? But when he heard this, he said, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. And while he was saying these things to them, suddenly a leader of the synagogue came in and knelt before him, saying, My daughter has just died. But come and lay hands on her, and she will live. And Jesus got up and followed him with his disciples. Then suddenly a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for twelve years came up behind him and touched the fringe of his cloak. For she said to herself, If I only touch his cloak, I will be made well. Jesus turned and seeing her, he said, Take heart, daughter, your faith has made you well. And instantly the woman was made well. When Jesus came to the leader's house and saw the flute players and the crowd making a commotion, he said, Go away, for the girl is not dead but sleeping. And they laughed at him. But when the crowd had been put outside, he went in and took her by the hand, and the girl got up. And the report of this spread throughout that district. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. How many times have we heard those words from Jesus? Follow me. How many times has those words leapt off of the pages of Scripture at us? How many times have we heard a sermon about following Jesus? How many times have we considered what those words, follow me, actually mean? And how many times have we assumed that we are properly doing so? But what if the call to follow Jesus requires much more than the superficial, consumeristic Christianity that we've become very accustomed to. We all buy into this consumeristic Christianity. We make our faith more about bumper stickers and t-shirts or the crosses around our necks. Or we demand our worship services cater to our preferred time slot, our preferred style of music, and our opinions. If there's one thing that I am exhausted over is how we have made the church about us. I feel that the church primarily in America has been slowly drifting further and further away from following Jesus. I'll never forget one night I got a phone call from a congregant who was upset about a theological claim that I had made. Don't worry, nobody here or online. And as I listened to this person spout off a bunch of partisanship rhetoric, that they were trying to pass off as Christian, I finally asked a simple question. Do you know who Zechariah was? And there was a long pause on the other side of the phone, and then they said, I know he was a wee little man. The reason that has stuck with me is because how can we claim to believe something if we don't know what it says. One subject that isn't getting enough coverage in contemporary Christian books and Christian media is the significant issue of biblical illiteracy. Two researchers who have looked into this problem in the church, George Gallup and Jim Castelli, write, Christian Americans revere the Bible, but by and large, they don't read it. And because we don't read it, we have become a nation of biblical illiterates. Let me give you some of their findings. They found that fewer than half of all Christian adults can name the four gospel accounts. 
Many Christians cannot identify two or three of the disciples. 60% of Christians cannot name five of the Ten Commandments. 82% of Christians believe that God helps those who help themselves is actually in the Bible and is a verse. Even among born-again Christians, 81% believe that the Bible teaches the primary purpose of life is to take care of one's family. 12% of Christian adults believe that Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. And over 50% of graduating high school seniors thought that Sodom and Gomorrah were husband and wife. A recent LifeWay research study suggests the following about the Bible reading habits among church attendees. 19% read every day. 26% read a few times a week. 14% read once a week. 22% read at least once a month. And then 18% read rarely or never. We say that we revere and believe the Bible but the majority of Christians have no idea what the Bible actually says. And what's worse is that we have developed a form of Christianity that has drifted further and further away from Judeo-Christian values and teachings. I am always, always weary of anyone who says, the Bible clearly says, because the Bible doesn't completely say anything, we interpret it, and it is a very complex book written by multiple authors from different times with different experiences and cultures. And by the way, Zechariah is not Zacchaeus. I can't answer for you, but I don't want to follow a version of Jesus I crafted in my own image. I don't want to follow Jesus that I have made up in my mind. I want to follow Jesus. And one of the only ways I learned to do that is by reading about his life, his ministry, his teachings that are found in scripture. I want to know what God is like. And the only way I can do that is by reading about Jesus, who I believe is the fullness of who God is and what God is like. I want to know what Jesus desires from me. And the only way I can do that is by diving deep into his teachings found in the Gospels. And to do so on a regular basis. In our passage today, Jesus teaches us what the church is supposed to be like. How we are to act and live in relationship with each other and others. When Jesus calls Matthew to follow him, Jesus invites him to a table to eat. A table where, if you read the rest of the story, other known tax collectors and sinners join to eat with Jesus as well. But when the Pharisees see this, they ask his disciples, why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? You see, to eat with someone in that time was to establish a covenant of friendship. And so the reason the religious leaders asked that question is because they felt people like the tax collectors should be avoided. They even suggested that by eating with someone like that was the same as condoning their lifestyle and or their choices. And yet what we see from Jesus is Jesus goes out of his way to eat with those people, even inviting Matthew, a tax collector, to sit and eat with him. This means to radically follow Jesus is to make room at the table for all people, regardless if we agree with them or not. It, it especially means to make room at the table for those who are not currently welcome to the table. Who are the tax collectors and sinners of today? Who are those in which the religious culture of our world is trying to avoid and shun? You see, this text nudges us to consider who we accept and who we don't. It begs us to question, who do we welcome at our own tables? Whom do we sit with? And who's missing from the table? Who's missing from our fellowship this morning? Our goal in following Jesus isn't to be 
some moral police like the, the Pharisees. We aren't to police the lifestyles of others like the Pharisees, but rather our goal as followers of Jesus is to offer friendship to anyone and everyone that comes to the table. The people we don't want to be friends with are exactly the type of people we should be inviting to sit with us. As a church, following Jesus means being a radical community of inclusion. Where we even get criticized for the people we welcome and hang around. Instead of a country club of exclusion where everyone looks and thinks alike. Jesus, behind, uh, upon hearing the Pharisees' question, why does he eat with those people, says something I just love. He said, those who are well have no need of a physician, but only those who are sick. There's a famous quote out there, the church is not a museum for saints, but a hospital for sinners. And while I agree with that statement, and there's a lot of truth in it, I would like to tweak it a little bit this morning. The church is not a diagnostic sister, center. It is a healing center. I say that because I think we've gotten really good at telling people what's wrong with them. You know what I mean? I think Christians are great at diagnosing the sickness of others, the sin, or what they believe is sin, of others. But when Jesus said those who are sick need a physician, his focus wasn't on diagnosing the sickness. His focus was on offering healing from it. Here's the truth that we all need to understand. None of us are well. We are all sick. And we all have the sickness of selfishness and self-centeredness. We don't need a diagnosis. We need a cure. We need treatment. We need a physician. And Jesus is saying to the Pharisees, who, by the way, are just as sick as the tax collectors and sinners that they refuse to eat with, that to radically follow Jesus is to offer hope and healing, not shame and condemnation. As a church, that means that we should be a place of healing for the hurt and the broken of our world. And I believe this is especially profound today because the church has done some of the hurting that people need to heal from. Just like the religious leaders of Jesus' time had caused a lot of trauma and a lot of hurt and pain to the people that Jesus sat with, the church today has caused a lot of hurt and trauma too. And we need to be a place where people can heal from that. Maybe, just maybe, Instead of criticizing people for not wanting to come to church or not going to church, maybe we should consider that we might be part of the reason they don't want to come to church. How can we be a place of healing for those who are hurting? But Jesus doesn't stop there. He continues. He says, go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not sacrifice. For I have come to call not the righteous, but sinners. Jesus is actually quoting the book of Hosea here. And if you know anything about the book of Hosea, the book begins by telling the story of Hosea's broken marriage. Hosea marries a woman by the name of Gomer, and they have three children, but eventually she is unfaithful to him. And God tells Hosea to continue to pursue Gomer with steadfast love. What we find is that God uses Hosea's broken marriage as a prophetic symbol of God's relationship with Israel. God, like a loving husband, has been faithful to Israel, but Israel has been unfaithful. Hosea begins to prophesy about the ways that, that Israel has been unfaithful to God. He begins by saying that they have no knowledge of God, and the word he uses for knowledge is a relational knowledge. In other words, they don't know the heart of God because they have forgotten God's law, which is a law of love and mercy, not of rituals and regulations. And so Hosea begins to expose the hypocrisy of their actions. He says they constantly break the Ten Commandments. They allow and even con contribute to grave injustices. 
But then they go to their, to their sacred temples and offer sacrifices to God and pretend as if everything is okay. In other words, they had made Judaism into a superficial, consumeristic religion that was all about them. This is the context of the words Jesus spoke. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy, not a sacrifice. Make no mistake. The Pharisees would have known the context and they would have understood what Jesus was saying to them. That he was saying they are just like Israel in Hosea's time. They do religious rituals, but they don't know God because they have no mercy for anyone else. In fact, the word mercy here is better translated compassion. I wonder how we as Christians, as a church, as the church, as Hayes Memorial, have forsaken being compassionate towards others for our religious rituals. Do we allow grave injustices or even contribute to them only to go to our church buildings and offer praise as if everything is fine when it's not? To follow Jesus means to be radically compassionate, especially towards those we often want to judge. Here's the thing. As much as we would like to believe it, the church isn't for or really about us. It's not Burger King we don't get to have it our way. It's about Jesus, and it's for the world. It's for the hurting, the broken, the lost, and the outcast. I believe that Jesus is calling us to follow him just like Matthew did, by being a Christian community that offers radical friendship, healing, and compassion. I started this sermon identifying what I think is one of the biggest issues facing the church today, that Christians by and large are biblically illiterate. I want to encourage all of us to take a self-assessment of the amount of time we read scripture. Do we do it daily, weekly, monthly, and how often, how much? We can't say that we believe the Bible if we never read it. And we can't follow Jesus if we don't read how to follow him. If you're here today, if you're watching online, and you want to study more scripture, I have a Bible study on Wednesday nights on the book of John at 620 in the lounge at church. We sit around a table, very informal, and we simply discuss scripture together. Come join us. Let us be the church that follows Jesus by being inclusive, by being a place where people can find healing and hope, and by being compassionate, even on those that we oftentimes don't want to be. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. We hope that you found this service encouraging and nourishing to your faith as you seek to grow closer to God, to become like Christ through following Him. If you would like to partner with us financially, you can do so in three different ways. In person, by mail, or online at www.hayesmemorialumc.org. Scroll down to the bottom of the page and click the Donate button. Please prepare your heart for a blessing. Go in the love of God, in the grace of Jesus Christ, his Son, in the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit, to be disciples, to make disciples, and to know that you are loved.